Well, I'm glad to, to have been here with you guys this weekend. Uh, I've been enjoying it. I was glad that I was invited to speak. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, most of you haven't met me before. Uh, the, the kids from Hillcrest know me, and I've talked with, I actually met you one time before, that's right, at the play box. Two times. Two times before. Yeah, we were down with the Salyers. Oh, the that's box. right, yeah. that's right. And uh, met uh, that guy, Logan, <laughs> um, at the singing in Newark a while back. But most of you I haven't met before, um, and you don't know me. Um, so uh, I don't know that I'm a whole lot worth introducing, but my name's Daryl. So there's, there's that for you at least. Um, my topic is ed edification at work. Uh, and, uh, you know, to talk about edification in action. We've talked about what edification is. Uh, we've talked about why it's important. Uh, a lot of good ideas, and I'm going to repeat a couple of the ideas that a couple of the other guys have, have spoken about. Uh, at first, I want to, if you're looking at your outline, uh, I want to just run through a few verses. What, what does the word edify mean in one word? You may think two words. I'm looking for one word. Bill. Bill. Bill is, is the key basic idea of that word. Um, I, when I said you may be thinking two words, I was thinking somebody might want to say build up. Uh, but the basic idea is really just build. Uh, at the top of my outline, I've just listed a bunch of verses. These are not all the verses where that Greek word is used. Uh, but sometimes that Greek word that we have translated build or build up or edify, it's translated those different ways in different verses. Uh, so in Matthew 7, the wise man builds his house on the rock. That's that word that we're talking about. Matthew 21, a parable about a landowner who planted a vineyard and built a tower. Matthew 23, the scribes and the Pharisees built the tombs of the prophets. I want to come back to that one in a second. Uh, Luke 7, the centur the, there was a centurion who appreciated the Jews, had learned about the God. Uh, at any rate, he built a synagogue for the Jews in their town. Uh, in the parable that Jesus spoke in Luke 12, the rich man decided to build bigger barns. Uh, in Acts chapter 7, a reference back to Solomon in the Old Testament who had built the temple. All these words, building things, you know, actual you know, physical structures. Um, the, there's one, that one I mentioned, Matthew 23, describes in the Pharisees building the tombs of the prophets. Can you think of a way that that one's a little different than the rest? You've got building a house, building a tower, building a synagogue, building bigger barns, built the temple. And the scribes and the Pharisees were said to be building the tombs of the prophets long time after those prophets were buried and put in tombs. So why are they still building tombs for those prophets? Somewhere to acknowledge where they are buried. Okay, that's the purpose. Radius, that, radius, okay. Display where they're buried. All right. Was it because they didn't listen to their words still, and they were killing their words. That's, that's one of the problems that they had, for sure. But weren't those tombs for those prophets built a long time ago? So why are they still building them? Figurative. I think it may not have been figurative. I think, you know, repairing them, maybe adding on to them. A lot of people have, have looked at this and thought, you know, the idea may be that they're adding on to the tombs of the prophets. They're extending how grandiose, somebody mentioned how the tombs would be, making them even more grandiose. They're building them more. In other words, building's not just a thing where you build it, okay, I'm done. Building can be an ongoing process. And I think we see that in that example. So you've got those verses about how the word is used in its most literal sense. Then Jesus comes along in Matthew 16, and says, on this rock, I will build my church. That's not talking about a physical structure. It's talking about he's going to build this group of people. Uh, and then you've got, in Acts and the Epistles, how we usually think of this word, the way this word is more important to us. Acts chapter 9, you know, Saul had been persecuting the Christians, then he's converted, and all that persecution came to an end, and verse 31 says that then the churches had rest and were built up. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1 talks about how love edifies love edifies rather than uh, doing things that might tear down people love does the things that build up people around 
Uh, and I want to actually turn to 1 Corinthians 14.4 and offer a thought to you that, that preparing for this presentation today really made me look at this verse a little different than I had before, and I think I understand it better than I had before. In 1 Corinthians 14, uh, Paul is talking about the abuse of the gift speaking in tongues. And I think that's been mentioned this weekend. I think he talked about that some. Um, what was, how were you people using the gift of tongues in a bad way? It was a valuable gift, but some of them were using it in a bad way. Come on, anybody? Speaking without an interpreter. Okay. Showing off, that's right. Um, they're not doing it. I mean, it's like if I came in here with the gift of tongues and started doing my lecture in Russian to you. I can speak Russian. I can't really. Um, does that do any of you any good? Okay. Verse 4 says, one who speaks in a tongue, and it's talking about doing it that very unhelpful way, edifies himself. And I always wondered... How would it edify me if I came in here speaking Russian to you guys? I don't know Russian, so it doesn't help me. You don't know Russian, so it doesn't help you. And yet this verse says he edifies himself. And I got to thinking again about the basic idea of building or building up. And we use the phrase this way. You know, people who put a profile online about themselves and they build themselves up. It's not really saying they're doing a positive thing about themselves, making themselves better. They're just doing stuff to look good. They're building themselves up. I think that's what this verse is saying. The one who speaks in a tongue is just building himself up. He's doing it to show off. But the one who prophesies uh, edifies the church, builds up the church, really does some actual good positive building up. Um, some of these other verses. Uh, for... Uh, Chapter 14, verse 17. I actually want to read verses 14 through 17. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What's the outcome then? I shall pray with the spirit, and I shall pray with the mind also. I shall sing with the spirit, and I shall sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only... How will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't know what you're saying? For you're giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. He's not built up. Now that says that praying and singing are things that can build up others. You know, we've been talking about, like, for example, the gift of prophecy builds people up. Why does, by the way, what is prophecy? What, is, what does it mean to prophesy? Predict the future. No. <laughs> but that's what we all think of. That's exactly what we all think of. But that's not really the meaning of to prophesy. What does to prophesy mean? To teach. N not exactly. Reveal. Reveal is very close. Forthtelling is very different than foretelling. A really good synonym for a prophet, one who prophesies, is a spokesman. Somebody mentioned, uh, you and Seth were talking about one was the other spokesman. I think he was your spokesman, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, Moses was there in Egypt, and Aaron was his spokesman. Aaron was his prophet. He would say, Aaron would say what Moses wanted said. And a prophet of God says what God wants said to the people. That's what prophecy is. It's saying to the people what God wants to be said to them. Now in the Old Testament, a lot of those times it included predicting the future, and so we kind of jump a step and we, we start thinking that prophecy is predicting the future, but really it's just telling what God wants said. So revealing God's word. Revealing God's word builds people up. That's what makes us stronger. That's what makes us better. That's what equips us to do more. That's what builds a Christian, is hearing the word of God. But these last verses we read, verses 14 through 17, mention a couple other things that build us. Prayer builds a Christian. Not just praying your own prayers, but hearing somebody else pray builds a Christian. Hearing people sing 
builds a Christian. How does that work? How does prayer build those who hear the prayer? Specifically in this verse, it's praying, giving thanks. If, some, if one of you leads a prayer here and your whole prayer is giving thanks for all the wonderful blessings we have, how does that build us? Reminds us what God has done for us. Bang. That's what it does. You hear him lead a prayer about all the incredible things God has done for us. And, you know, you kind of know those things, but you're freshly reminded of those things. All of that stuff comes back to mind. Maybe some stuff you never thought about before. And you're stronger for it. You've been built by that prayer. So teaching and instruction, as we think of it in the formal sense, is not the only things that build us. Singing also builds us. You know, when we hear these songs uh, and we take those messages to heart and, you know, Jonathan was talking about words, songs with good meaning, with music that fits it well. That moves the soul and that builds us. So we'll come back to to those ideas in a few minutes talking about practically uh, doing this as we talk about edification and action. By the way, um, Um, I mean, you can you can set it on the, the whatever, you, or you can hold it like that. That's fine. I just need to see it. Um, and now I'm off track of where I am. Um, okay, First Thessalonians five. Uh, we should encourage one another and build up one another. Uh, that's just an ongoing thing that needs to be happening. Second uh, Corinthians chapter twelve. Look at Second Corinthians chapter twelve with me. Verse 19. Remember, there's 1 Corinthians and everything that was in that. There's 2 Corinthians and everything in that. And at the end of 2 Corinthians, here in chapter 12, verse 19, Paul says, all this time you've been thinking that we're defending ourselves to you. And Paul had offered some defense of him being an apostle because there had been some in Corinth saying, Paul's not an apostle, don't listen to him. Um... But he's saying, all this time you thought that our whole goal, our mission, is to defend ourselves. And really his mission was to defend God and the interests of God. And that included him being an apostle. But anyway, he goes ahead to say, actually, it is in the sight of God that we've been speaking in Christ. And all for your upbuilding. Everything that they've been saying was for their edification, their upbuilding. Now, think for a minute about the kinds of things Paul had said to them in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. What, how would you characterize all the things that Paul says to them in 1 Corinthians? No, no, no. Yeah! <laughs> you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, how could you be so silly as to do this thing also wrong? No, no, no. And he says, I've written all these things for your edification. You know, sometimes we think only really feel-good things are edifying. And if somebody comes with a criticism, oh, that's not edifying. Paul said everything he wrote to them, and the large majority of it was criticism of things they were doing. He says all of that was for your edification. So, you know, we don't want to always be no, no, no. But there are times for it. And these two letters were a time for it, his two letters to Corinth. And so criticism done the right way, speaking the truth in love, um, is also a form of building people up. Because if something's, if, if a person is building himself wrong, then he needs to hear the criticism. He needs to have that pointed out, that you're going the wrong way here. You need to turn this around and do things the right way. Um, I had a house built some years ago, uh, and you know I hired a contractor, and he built the house that I wanted built. And I would go out there uh, almost every day. I'd stop by and see the progress that they were making. And one day, I saw that they poured the foundation wrong, which was going to make my garage a foot shorter than it should be, and the dining room a foot larger than it should be. I wanted more room in my garage. That's why I planned it the way I planned it. 
but now you know he's poured the foundation putting the wall in the wrong place and it was really too late to do anything about that the damage was done I mean I could have made them tear up the whole slab but that's kind of a big deal so that was that was just that way my garage is going to be a foot shorter now than I wanted it sometimes in our lives things get done wrong and the point of criticism gets pointed out but because of wrong that's been done there's still consequences of that now another time I went out to the house and the room between the bedroom and the living room was off by a foot and the wall in the living room it had a fireplace in the middle window on either side it's all symmetrical I like symmetrical things <laughs> And I noticed, you know, this wall is off, so now on the left side of the fireplace, it's going to be like, eh, and on the right side of the fireplace, it's going to be big like it was supposed to. This is going to look stupid. I said, you got you to gotta move the wall. And that time he moved the wall, because it was just taking studs down and stuff. I went, and I criticized, and I said what was right and what was wrong, and that way the house got built the way it should be built. Our lives need that criticism sometimes so that they, our lives get built the way they ought to be built. Um, okay. Um, oh, an, another thing, and this is connected to what I said before about building the tombs of the prophets, that uh, it, it can be an ongoing process. And with us, it should be an ongoing process. Um, and I lived in the Czech Republic for five years. And, and Prague is the, the, the cathedral, the... I guess it's the St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague. It's huge. If you look up Cathedral Prague, that's, that's the one you'll see probably. It was begun, the construction for that temple was begun in the year 1377. And it was completed in 1927. Nearly 600 years of construction. Building can continue a long time. So as we think about building, it's an ongoing process. You're building. For your whole lifetime, you're building yourself, and you're helping build others. All right, one more passage about building, although the word edify or build is not in it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a, a common passage. I'm sure you know this passage. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Nowhere in that verse do you see the word edify or build up. But is it talking about that? It's talking about making us equipped for every good work. You take a person who's not yet equipped for every good work, or maybe at all good works, and you give him scripture. You teach him. Sometimes you reprove him. Sometimes you correct him. Sometimes you train him in righteousness. All of that builds us and makes us equipped for all the good things that God wants us to do. Okay. At this point, I want you to close your outline books if you're looking at them. <laughs> um, because I know when I'm looking at somebody else's outline, a lot of the time I start looking ahead and I don't want you to look ahead. Um... And I want us to think, I want to get in your head about some things. Uh, and I want us to get into the Word about some things. Uh, and if you look at the outline, you're going to know and some of the things I'll ask. You know, you'll, okay, he wants that answer. I don't want you doing that. I want you thinking. Um, but I'm still going to have my notes to look at. Um, so I've divided the rest of this into to two categories, although the second one is divided into two subcategories. But... Edification at work in our assemblies, Sundays, Wednesdays, whenever it is that, that you meet with your brethren. And secondly, uh, edification at work on a personal level. First of all, I want us to talk about edification at work in our assemblies. Um, what can you do? Show up. That, that's going to be my last point in this section, because that's real important. Somebody, I think Jonathan mentioned that. Oh, there you are. Because um, um, that's real important. I want to come back to that. Um, beyond showing up, and we're talking about edification in our assemblies, some of you girls may be thinking, well, that's all the guys. They're the only ones up there, you know, doing stuff. 
Um, let's talk about singing for a moment. Uh, not song leading, talk about that in another moment, but singing. How can you build, you know, we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that praying and singing both, when done well, edify those who hear. How does your singing edify people? If you put your heart into it, people around you are going to see that. Okay. Feel that it affects the mood, the environment, the atmosphere. Exactly. Good answer. Give me some examples of of that, but done in a way that doesn't edify. Copying your songs at the last minute. Okay. <laughs> if, if you're the song leader, coming up with your songs at the last minute. Uh, so, you know, you might want to choose a theme, but no, I don't have time. Uh, you might want to think about how should this song be led, what tempo, but you don't have time, just last minute. But just everybody in general, not just the song leader. What ends up being done in a way that does not edify? Maybe, like, not really knowing how to sing, so you just kind of do watermelon the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've not heard that. But I, I've heard that done, I just haven't heard that term for it. But yeah. Um, what else? Not paying attention to the leader. Okay. The tempo. Yeah, a leader's up there, he's thought about, hopefully he's thought about, how this song should be led. The tempo for the song, the power of the song, or the softness of the song. And if you're just there singing the way you've always sung, which <laughs> may be really slow, or really loud, and you want some softness, and you know, pay attention to the leader so that he can do his job. And as you join him in that effort, it makes the song a lot more powerful and meaningful. What else can you do that ends up not being edifying? So I to just kind of mouth the words because everybody around you sings really well and maybe you may or may not sing you know certified gold singing structure but you're afraid that if you try to sing as loud as they do that you know you won't hit the note yeah you're embarrassed about that so you just decide you know, just saying you're quiet and nobody will know the difference right right you know scripture tells all of us to sing not just the talented ones <laughs> Scripture tells all of us to sing to one another. If you're singing to one another, they've got to hear you or it means nothing. They've got to hear you. I want to tell you about the worst singer among brethren I've ever worshipped with. And I also want to tell you about the best singer among brethren that I've all, all, ever worshipped with. And they're both the same guy. When I lived in the Czech Republic, Ladya was his name. Well, it still is his name, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> he, you know, some people say they can't carry a tune in the bucket. Some people say they, they, they're tone. He was. I mean, he could not carry a note, and it sounded awful. But he sang, and he sang out. And, you know, sometimes I was sitting next to him, and, you know, sometimes it made it a little more difficult. But there he was singing with the biggest smile on his face because it meant so much to him. And I was more edified by his singing than most other people I've ever sung with because he didn't care that, he knew he didn't sound good, but he sang. And that helped me. So don't worry about your voice not sounding good. You can edify those around you through your singing, regardless of whether you sound good or not. Now, there's also a lot of people who say, uh, I don't sound good, I can't sing well, blah, blah, blah. And I've worked with some people who, who end up saying that and saying, you know, I can hear them, I can tell they're, they've got more talent, a better ear than Ladja did. And they can sing. And a few of them have been willing to work with me, and I've gotten them to the point that they realize, oh, I can sing. <laughs> so don't sell yourself short. I mean, if you truly cannot sing. Now, I haven't heard anybody this weekend that I thought was tone deaf. Of course, I hadn't heard all of you. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of you may think you can't sing. But <laughs> Paul says he can't right now. 
Um, but I'll bet you you can. And get with someone who knows about singing and get them to try to help you. I'd be willing to help you, but I don't live real close to all of you. Um, singing really edifies. And, and you can learn to, to be more edifying. Because, I mean, really, if you can't sing, sing anyway and be like Ladia, who is more edifying to me than almost anyone. <laughs> but if you can learn to sing, that makes it even better. Uh, all right. So then song leading, what can song leaders do to make things more edifying for other people? Have a theme, have some forethought into it. Okay. Say something before the song, say, you know, a history about the song, like a lot of people um, trying to think of uh, the song. Um, you talked about it a little bit. Song leading class. No. <laughs> Um, I, I bet it was one of two songs that I talked about. It might have been Amazing Grace or it might have been um, When the Sea Billows Roll. It is well with, it is well with my yeah, soul. Yeah, okay. We're talking about that one, how the history behind it. Yeah. And things like that. Well, that and Amazing Grace both. Um, how you, you talked about um, the history behind it. And it, it made it made more of a connection for me at least because I knew the situation of the person when they wrote the song and what it must have meant for them or maybe just you know a lot of I know a lot of people use the songs that, and uh, hymns advised by our, our congregation we do and it's got a little passage above it and we just go to it and just make some comments about it just don't go through the motions and sing it the same way everybody does because then it's just kind of a monotone type of situation. Yeah a song leader can can make things so much more edifying for everybody in the congregation by saying something about some of the songs that he leads. Thank you, Noah. <laughs> um, I know we all didn't get much sleep. So it's okay, but uh, yes. What they put uh, emphasis on my singing, where say in a certain part of the song you might put a certain emphasis, like you might slow down or you might go soft and put emphasis, that's going to reflect more on you because if you're doing, you're not just flowing right through it, you're going to stop if you have to say, you want them to slow the tempo down for that that section there, you're going to slow that down and go soft, you're going to think more and more on that. Uh -huh. So where they put reflections and stuff in there or changing the pitch or something, you're going to reflect more on that section. Okay, so taking a moment to say something about the meaning of the song to draw people's attention to the meaning, uh, reading some scripture to go along with it, uh, pointing out, you know, this part of the song, you know, this is what it's saying, and that calls for this kind of mood, what we're singing. All those things really help. Uh, you know, Jonathan mentioned this morning about the way singing is sometimes and the way a song is led sometimes, and you just can't wait till the song is over. Um, and, and some of the times it's because the song is led so slow, it's supposed to be a happy song. Uh, somebody was talking about when, when we sing, If the skies above you are gray, you are... And, you know, and, and the, you know that's, maybe that's a fitting pace for the, that line of the song. <laughs> but the rest of that song, uh, now I can't sing the chorus and be happy. But anyway, you know, it, it, it should reflect the mood of the words. Um, all right, enough about singing. Leading prayers. Do your part to make it meaningful. We read in 1 Corinthians 14 a few minutes ago about praying and the edifying effect that that can have on people. When you lead prayers, or you, you know, and this isn't just men, because I think sometimes you girls and ladies are together, and, and you lead prayers among one another. When you lead prayers, if you want that to be edifying to the others, to help build them up, pray about real things. Talk about real things in your prayers. Real things that are going on. Real things that you're wanting help with. We all know, at least I think probably we do, the certain phrases that get repeated so many times in prayers, the kind of standard phrases Anybody? What, what's a standard phrase used in a prayer? Anybody? Guide, guard, direct. Guard, guide, guard, and direct us. Give me some others. 
Pray for those who are sick. Pray for those who are sick. Sometimes we pray for those who are sick of this congregation. I'm always wondering, who are those people who are sick of this congregation? But anyway. <laughs> um, what are some of the other phrases that get used? Pray for those who are traveling. Pray for those who are traveling. Protect and watch over us. Protect and watch over us. A ready recollection. Give the preacher a ready recollection. <laughs> Come on, there's a bunch of them. Ways you know, to it's like the one time you need to think of them. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> um, what? Amen. Um, that's a good one. Um, pardon? Thank you for this day. Okay. But sometimes I hear a prayer that's nothing but just a recitation of all those standard phrases. Banish them! <laughs> get rid of those! Now, I don't really want to say you have to get rid of all of those. Because they can be said in a good way. And, you know, no matter what you decide, if you decide to banish all of them, some folks in the congregation where you are are still going to use them. And I don't want you to go back and think evil of those people. Sounds but. like you're getting at vain repetitions. You know, maybe the first time that phrase was used, people were like, that's a really good phrase. Right, <laughs> right. Right to the idea. <laughs> and then it, and, but then it became repetitive. Yeah. Instead of something that was fresh, that they, they really directed their thoughts in a good way. Because that's prayer directs thoughts. That's right. In a way that maybe we're, we're not used to thinking or something like that. And it, it is this direction of where we're, we're, you know, what we're doing and that and where we're at and what's happening and, and communicating to God, you know, of course, with that. Lane did a great job uh, with the prayer for uh, today when he did it before we ate. And that, and it was, it was, it was, you know, he said things I haven't heard of in a prayer. I mean, for someone that's young and that's something new and, and it was in English. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not Russian. <laughs> Logan. Uh, and also, I mean, there are those phrases people use, and I think we all can tell uh, when somebody is searching for a way to just lengthen a prayer. I think that it should be a certain amount of time. Um, now, some prayers tend to go long, and you can tell the person is actually just really speaking from their heart and trying to convey the words appropriately, and you, and you, you can sense that. But then there are. <coughs> Or there's where it, you can like see their mind racing and they come up with the phrase spit out real fast and you know, spin them out real fast because I think it's got to fill a certain amount of time. And then conversely, there are also people who take the prayer and they're not really addressing God; they're addressing the congregation. Yeah, yeah. And that's also problematic because Lord help those people who only want to sit on the back pew. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, in your prayers, instead of, Father, we pray for those who are sick of this congregation, pray for brother so-and-so, whoever it is, that's facing a surgery that week. Pray for sister so-and-so who's sick at home and can't make it out, and Lord, help her life to be easier, and if there's something that we can do for her, help show us what that is. Uh, you know, name people in your prayers. Uh, when you, if you want to say something about help the one who's going to be speaking today, you know, don't say help the one speaking today. <laughs> say help Heath, you know, remember the things that he's thought about and help him to, to share those thoughts with us in a way that, that helps us know and helps us learn instead of just give uh, Heath a ready recollection, but really give some thought to what it is you want to ask God to do in regard to heat speaking that day. Leanne. Um, I was going to say, I think sometimes when we pray, we forget that we're supposed to be human and we don't have to sound like these eloquent, like perfect speakers because God knows what we mean. And that's not to say we should be irreverent, but we should pray like we're normal human beings. We don't need to use like all this. Like I know there are people that get up sometimes and they have really fancy, well-worded prayers. And not to say that that's wrong, but like sometimes it just seems like 
it has more of an impact when you're on a more... When you're just speaking normally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, one man I know, uh, when, I, when I'm talking with him, just a normal conversation, he speaks one way. If he's teaching a Bible class, if he's preaching a sermon, if he's speaking at the Lord's table, if he's leading a prayer, he speaks a very different way. And the one example that, that always sticks out in my mind about the difference is, you know, I'm going to hand this Bible to you. And now, that's the way we normally speak. But if he's up there teaching a class and talking about handing the Bible unto you, <laughs> he always puts his to, uh, to unto. When I, you know, in normal speech, he doesn't do that. But anytime he's up there, he, his whole speech pattern changes. And it becomes this formal kind of thing. And that's not wrong. But I think you're right that just speaking in a normal way, without having to sound clerical, religious, whatever, is a much more, it's a thing that connects with people better. People should be able to relate to it. Yes. Cole. Um, I think when, when you think about like the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, um, reading the lyrics of the song to talk about, you know, we talk to him about our problems and, and speak to him. I don't know how often I speak to my friends in third person. And, and well, not in third person, but in a formal right. setting. Right. You don't talk to your friends in a formal setting. What are you going to be doing this evening is normal. We don't say, Help us the next appointed time. Yeah, yeah. Don't <laughs> <laughs> be a Burger King the next appointed time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, exactly. He's our friend. I mean, I'm not saying you should like. When I talk to my friends, and I'm not going to give Jesus a redneck prayer, but yeah, right. But, when you talk but if to redneck is your way of speaking, then then that's the way you pray. <laughs> I, I don't talk to your friends formally, and if you, Jesus, if we're supposed to, you know, treat Jesus as a friend, then you don't have to talk to your friends formally. Right. Um, Not that it's wrong to. Leading at the Lord's table, um, we're supposed to do those things in remembrance of Him. So if you're up there and you're the one responsible to say something. Give some thought to what way, what things you can say that day that will really help people go back and see and appreciate and be touched in the heart by what Jesus did for us, by what the Father did for us in that act. Because what does 1 Corinthians 11 say we do if, we, if our minds are not on the body of Christ? different passage, that's Hebrews we drink unto ourselves damnation so if nobody's thinking about the things they should be thinking about oh here's a cup of damnation go ahead and drink that yeah. <laughs> you want to help everybody really focus their minds and think about what that event what our communion is about in that moment uh, teaching and preaching to edify others. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, we read that earlier. Uh, scripture, All scripture is good for reproof. I'm not going to get them in order. Uh, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Maybe I did get them in the right order. Um, it does those things for us. So when you get up to speak, have something to say. Have something that, that somebody can learn something from. You know, not everybody's going to learn from it. You know, you're going to have a bunch of people there who already know very well the points that you're making. Uh, but you're going to have some other people there. If you've thought about something good and helpful to say, you're going to have some people there who can walk away. Wow, that helped me. Hadn't thought about it that way before. Hadn't noticed that point before. And so you can build them. Um, another, several of these things we've been talking about, mostly leading in the assembly. Uh, we did talk about singing that affects everybody. Um, another thing that everybody can do, express appreciation when others leading do a good job. That builds me up. When somebody comes to me and says, I really appreciate the way you made this point, or I appreciate the way you led that song, or whatever it is, that helps me. 
Um, and you can do that. When you see somebody get up and they've got a scripture reading and you can tell they've, they've read it beforehand and they've thought about what that passage means and they read it in a way that reflects that, um, I'll just read a couple of verses here at a random passage I'll open up to. Um, you get up to do the scripture reading. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ, Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony born of the prophet. Uh, you know, <laughs> if it's your first time, that may be how it sounds. But get to the point where you're really thinking about the passage and you read, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony born at the proper time. You know, read it in a way. And when you, do, when, when you hear somebody do that, then go to them and say, I really appreciate how you did that. Or I really appreciate how you presented the thoughts in your lesson. I really appreciate the prayer you led. It, it touched me. It helped me. Let people know. That builds people up. Um, you know, I, I think Heath made a good point last night about emotion and just feeling good. That by itself is not necessarily edifying. But when you can say something that's truly encouraging to somebody, that is. So keep that in mind. Um, all right. Uh, be there. Uh, uh, Isaac, you mentioned being there. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 26. Uh, you know this, at least you know verse 25. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised his faith. He, there's the danger of wavering. <coughs> How many of you have had a moment, a day, a week, a month, when your faith was kind of iffy, had some problems. Yeah. This verse is telling us how to address that problem. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good works, not forsaking our own assembling together. Some people think that going to church is like going to the gym. Does going to the gym help you? Yes, it, it builds you up physically. And if you don't go, does that hurt anybody? Yourself. Maybe yourself. It doesn't hurt anybody else. You know, you just decided, well, I don't feel like it tonight. Uh, I've got other more important things to do tonight. It's not going to hurt anybody else if I don't go. You know, it's not like I'm going with a buddy and he's counting on me to spot him or anything like that. So it's not hurting anybody else. I'm just not going. It's not going to. Going to church is not like that. All the things that we read about in Scripture that happen when Christians gather together, none of those verses say, be there so that you can get strength from them. None of the verses say it that way. It's always be there so you can do it for them, so you can edify them, so you can strengthen them. So your absence, it's not like missing the gym. People miss what you can put into that activity when you're not there. So you need to be there. That needs to be where you want to be. If you're part of a congregation that's agreed to work and worship together, then you want to be part of that whenever it's happening. Um, all right. Let's get to this last part of what I want to talk about, which is edification at work on a personal level. And I divided this into two categories. Um, general spiritual sharing, which I may rush through a little bit, um, and sharing about personal struggles. So there's general sharing and edifying that we're doing in all of this setting. And then there's very personal edifying, building up, dealing with some personal struggles that we may have. Um, first of all, general spiritual sharing. But, well, actually, this first thought is in regard to both of them. I think we sometimes fall short on edifying in our assemblies, but much more so, I think we fall short on edifying on a personal level. 
Um, that's my opinion. I, I might be wrong about that, but that's my opinion. Um, how does edification work on a personal level? Let's see, I've got one point here, but I think I decided to wait and make that later and I forgot to cross it out. Let me make sure I've got it later. Yes, I do. Okay. All right. One of the difficulties with, you know, just during the middle of the week, got a friend who's a Christian, and you want to do something edifying. Does that sometimes feel a little awkward? Just because we don't do it much unless it's a directed activity. You know, this is a directed activity. You know, somebody planned, these two people planned for this to happen. So it doesn't feel awkward at all. But just you and your friend on Thursday afternoon, and you decide, you know, I want us to spend some time edifying one another. Does that maybe feel a little, how do I do that? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're better than me. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes we're not used to, to talking with one another just on our own initiative. It's not a planned activity. It's just, you know, you and me talking about something spiritual on a personal level or doing spiritual things. You know, you talk about gaming. You talk about hunting. You go hunting. You spend time gaming. Uh, you uh, talk about sports. You play sports. Uh, you sit around talking about who's hanging out with who. Uh, you know, all those things that we do and talk about together. But what we are ultimately is Christians. And that ought to be something that just on our own initiative, we do something about with one another. I don't know if everybody here has already been baptized in Christ, but I'm confident most of you have been. You are children of God. You're not just kids who are tagging along with their parents to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. You have given yourself to the Lord because you see what he did for you and you know that you need what he did for you and you've made a choice in your life about who you want to be. If you become a Christian, you've made that choice. So spend time with spiritual things instead of just all the other stuff, unless there's a directed activity, on your own. Because you made a choice about who you are. Spend time with one another. Pray. Have a prayer together. What, what, what do you mean, let's have a prayer? It's not lunch time. <laughs> Talk about things that are on your mind and then pray about them. Spend some time talking about the Word. Spend some time talking about some things you've been thinking about. General spiritual sharing. You know, look at Jesus and the disciples, and there was the public teaching, and then after the public teaching with their downtime, they didn't just forget about all of that. They get away from the crowd, and the disciples were asking, tell us more, what did that parable mean you were talking about? And you can just go through passages in the book of Acts. Uh, I'm going to hit a couple of these. Acts chapter 1. Where you see the Christians, not as part of a directed activity, not as part of the assembly, but being spiritual with one another. Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. This is after the resurrection. It's before the day of Pentecost. And they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to an upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Je uh, Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas, son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Just on their own, spending time in prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Verse 46. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God. Day by day, they're spending time with one another, doing spiritual things. Cole. Oh, I thought your hand was up. No. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so set aside some of the gaming and the hunting and the sports. None of those things are wrong. But set aside some of that so that you can spend time edifying one another with some spiritual things. Something, dear, I'm sorry. Um, sometimes, you know, we think, you know, well, what are we going to study? What are we going to do? Um, I remember my dad, when, when we were young, we would watch TV, and I don't care if it was a show, a commercial, or whatever, but he would usually find a Bible verse that had something to do with that. And it kind of taught us, I mean, maybe you like your game, maybe you like to hunt, maybe you like to go to movies, maybe you guys can't wait to see Star Wars, um, and that, but you're going to see God's word in action all about you when you're discussing these things that you like, you, you, you're going to be talking about, if you're thinking about application in your head, you're going to be thinking about Bible verses that come to mind with that, Yeah. and that, that, that's what it's all about. It isn't just about memorizing the word and that. It's about putting that in your life and him doing it, being the living word, um, <coughs> and that living the word in your life, and that and looking at application, and that um, Jesus taught in parables all the time because they're just walking around, they're hungry, but he used that as a chance to talk to them about spiritual things, and that, you know, you're going to be a fisherman. You're fishing right now, but I'm going to make you a fisherman. But, you know, when you're getting together and maybe you've read a book that was really neat or whatever, you can find spiritual application in anything in your life. I mean, just going out and taking a walk, you can see things. Yeah. If your mind is on that offset that you're thinking about that, so it doesn't always have to be, let's, let's get together and we're going to study First John 1 or something. And that, but but more about looking for God in your life, looking for the Bible in your life, looking for seeing. There's nothing new under the sun. There is not a single movie I've ever seen that didn't have something about the Bible in there, or remind me of something in the Bible, or reverse and that kind of thing. Yeah. So keep it in your heart and in your mind and close to you. That no matter what you're doing. You can, does this make sense? I know some of you are tired, and I have some gum here if you want a piece of gum. <laughs> Noah, do you want a piece of gum? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know everybody's kind of tired in that. But does this make sense when I'm trying to say, you know, can you think about that? I mean, we could probably start a conversation about something that we've seen, and we could pop out all these verses in that left and right if we put our minds to it, and that it really taught me to look for that. And to just connect, you know, you, you sit through a movie and you watch the movie and there's some thought-provoking thing. And after the movie, you're talking about, oh, when he did this and when he did that. But also, you know, you know, there was this part of the movie and they were talking about this. And, and you know, that's either, either, you know, that kind of fits with what is being taught in, in the Bible here. Or it's just sad that they think that way because, you know, they've got this view of life which is totally different than, the, than what we learn is true and just connect either way. Things with scripture. Um, all this stuff about spending time with spiritual things instead of just all our other activities. There's a phrase that people in your age group make. Okay, what? Um, before we move on, something else you could think. <clears throat> like you kind of trained yourself to look for things like that. And God, so we're taught to take the scripture and apply it to our lives. And if you are looking at things and thinking of scripture, that would encourage, discourage, or apply to that, then you really aren't applying the scripture to your life. Because that should really always be on your mind. Should I be doing this? If so, what says I can? And if it doesn't say I can, what says I can't? And why? Yeah. Because that, that really should be your judge of everything. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now, there's a phrase that I hear, or I see it in chats, um, and it's, I'm bored. Sometimes it's different. Sometimes it's, I'm so bored. <laughs> <laughs> this past Thanksgiving, a few weeks ago, I was with my family. We have a big family. Uh, and uh, we were playing the game we played. Was it this morning? Yeah, it was this morning. The game we played where there's one round where you describe it, and the next round where you just say one word and another. So we were playing that game. And one of the words that was on the papers was teenager. <laughs> and... When we got to the round that, uh, that you just had to say one word, I forget who it was in my family, but their one word was bored. 
and like five hands went up, teenager, teenager, <laughs> everybody knew. Now, the problem is, not only when we're young, a lot of times adults are, are like this too, but it's especially among the young, we kind of think that life is about entertainment, that there's always got to be something to do that I find entertaining, that I find fun. And if there isn't something like that, I'm so bored. You ever hear your parents say, I'm so bored? How many of you have heard your parents say that? Not a one of you. <laughs> you know why? Because they've learned that's not what life's about. They've learned life is not about always having something fun, entertaining to do. They've learned that life is about being responsible and doing things that need to be done that are profitable for other people around them. Helpful for their families, helpful for their kids, helpful for the lady across the street who can't take care of herself. They're busy doing all of those things. So you don't think that life always is, has to be filled with something fun and entertaining to do. Oh, this sounds terrible because I'm contrasting fun and entertaining with spiritual things. <laughs> so do the boring thing and do something spiritual. That's not really what I'm trying to say. But don't look for the typical fun entertainment as a way to spend your time. Because if you do, you're going to have those times when there's nothing of that kind to do. And so you're bored. Instead, realize, I could spend some time doing something spiritual, something helpful, something edifying for people around me. Okay, I'm going to take a few more minutes if, if you all are willing to bear me. Pardon? Oh, yes. Just real quick comment. Part of that, though, the idea that if you're doing something spiritual, you know, that's, it's obligatory, it's boring, it's something you don't like to do. And, you know, combined with the mindset, that mindset of craving entertainment and constantly consuming entertainment, you know, there's a reason that dichotomy is so stark in people my age, and it's because entertainment is entirely self-directed. That's right. Doing spiritual things, being of service to others, is entirely other directed. So the, the two are at odds, and if we train ourselves to view entertainment as this great and high good in life, then that's going to set us in a mindset that is at odds with what God has called good in our lives. That's right. So we need to, instead of focusing on self, be where we need to be edifying one another, building one another up, and spend some of our time to do that. Now, one last little segment I want to say a few things about, and that's edification at work on a personal level, dealing with personal, specific struggles. Um, everybody has struggles. You may think your preacher doesn't have any struggles with anything. You may think your elders don't have any struggles with anything. You may think the wonderful old lady a church who's just so wonderful and special doesn't have any struggles with anything. You are mistaken. We all have struggles. We may or may not recognize them. Some older people may think they don't have any. They do, whether they realize it or not. Some of their struggles may be anger. Some of their struggles may be really paying the kind of attention to their kids that they should be. But, you know, it could be a lot of different things. It may not be the same struggles that you have. But everybody has struggles. Um, the problem is, or a problem is, we don't talk about personal struggles. And that's all of us. We're afraid to other, for other people to know what we struggle with. We don't want them to know. Why don't we want them to know? Because they'll look down on us. We're afraid they'll look down on us. Fear of failure. Fear of failure. And so we, we don't talk about it. We don't want anybody to know. How can we help one another with our personal struggles? How can we build one another up? How can we edify one another if none of us ever talk about what we're really struggling with? We've got to get that out in the open and talk about it. Doesn't mean you have to talk about it with everybody in the church where you are. But find a few people to talk about those things with. Because if, if, if you want to edify somebody... Well, let's do it this way. Uh, everybody up from that sofa for a second. <coughs> Is this 
step away from it, if you will, please, for a moment. Isaac. I don't really know you well, but come over here for a second. <laughs> I want to edify you with your personal struggles. I know we've never done anything except for being the mafia together and kill people. <laughs> but what are you really struggling with in life? He's not going to answer me that question, is he? <laughs> I mean, maybe you would. I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> <No. laughs> he doesn't know me. I don't really know him. How can we ever... You can... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um... If we don't know one another, and we're not willing to, to get to know one another, on a level where we're aware of one another, we're never going to be able to edify one another on a personal level with personal struggles. Too often in our assemblies, what happens is the singing, the prayers, and the sermon, and the Lord's Supper, and all of that, and then after church, there's some surface chit-chat about what you did the day before, and then you go home and you never really talk about anything serious with anyone. You don't talk about your struggles. You don't say to a brother at church, I'm really having a hard time dealing with this, and you know, it's something that I messed up on recently. Have you, how often do you hear that kind of conversation? We don't talk about it, and we need to talk about those things instead of keeping those struggles secret. Um, if you've got no idea what others are struggling with, you can't help them with their struggles. So if you want to edify someone, if you want to edify those around you, build them up with what their personal struggles are, what do you have to do so that they'll open up to you about that? Cole. Don't get on the same level as them. You gotta. Nobody's gonna talk to you unless they feel like they can trust you. I mean, I'm not telling anybody anything about me unless I trust them. Um, I think that probably is for most people, unless they have absolutely no secrets. Um, but you have to have a, a level playing and some sort of. Um, relatability between the person and yourself. You have to, I'm not going to walk up to some elderly woman and say, hey, I'm having trouble with my guys. They're causing me some problems. She, she doesn't know that situation. She might be able to point me to a person that wouldn't, but she won't. She might not be able to help me with situations like that. It's, and it's, for me, it's more edifying to get feedback from somebody that's my age or a peer or someone that I'm close to because if I trust them enough to tell them that, they probably know a thing or two about me and they'll know, they'll know how I operate to an extent. So if we want to be able to be in a position to edify others with their struggles, we've got to get real with them talk about real things, and acknowledge that sin is tempting. You know, you can't pretend, oh, I'm not tempted by anything, I don't have any problems, but what are yours? Yeah. <laughs> We've got to be able to sympathize with people's weaknesses. Remember a verse about sympathizing with weakness? Hebrews chapter 4? Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 15? sympathize with us because he's that Jesus can sympathize with our weakness because he's been tempted in all points as are we, yet in his case without sin. That's not our case. And it needs to be clear that that's not our case. It is not a mistake to sympathize with someone in their weakness and say, you're right, that is hard to avoid. You're right, that is tempting. I feel that too. I'm tempted with that same thing. Don't think that you've got to hold yourself up as somebody who, no, I, I don't have any problems like that. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll try to help you with it. They're not going to talk to you. Sympathize with the tempting nature of sin. Don't pretend 
that none of it is appealing for you or you just find easy because it's the lazy way to do it. Maybe you've struggled with that. Let them know that you see how easy that is to fall into, Cole. Um, Paul, uh, in one of his letters, uh, talks about that. He says, I, I become all things to all people Yep. To, to build them up. And that doesn't mean he says that I become the Jew for the Jews or I became poor for those who were poor. He didn't actually go back to the Jewish rituals and traditions and laws or whatever, but he didn't. It's not that he became like them in a spiritual sense, but he humbled himself to their level to a point where it didn't feel like he was attacking them. Right, right. You can't, you can't have, some, nobody's going to tell you something that they feel like you're attacking them. Right. They, they, and you have to become relatable to them. Otherwise, they won't want to talk to you. I mean, well, kind of like you said earlier, if you, if I'm coming to you with a problem and you pretend you've never dealt with it, then I'm going to go to somebody else who has dealt with it because I want somebody that's relatable to my situation. Yeah, that's right. So if, again, if you want to be able to edify other people, build them up, you've got to take this approach and let them know if I don't struggle with that thing, I struggle with similar things, you know, and, and you've got to be open about your own struggles and failures in order to be someone that others can open up to so that then you can talk about, you can face things together and edify one another, build up one another. That doesn't mean you accept the sin. That doesn't mean you say, oh, it's okay. You know, we all mess up sometimes. That, saying that is very different than saying, yeah, I've messed up with that myself. You know, I understand how difficult that is. You don't say, oh, it's okay. So you don't approve of the sin. You don't accept the sin. You don't ignore the sin. You be clear about what's right and wrong. But don't act as if you've never struggled. Because <laughs> then they're not going to want to open up. Now, if there's somebody who's just not really having the desire to do what's right, then, you know, I don't know necessarily what you can do. Uh, but uh, if somebody, you know, there's a, a healthy side of them that wants to do what's right, then, then you can help them if you'll open up and, and, and talk with them at that same level. Um, so I've just got three little attitudes to just mention and then I'll be done. But was there a hand up over here? Uh -huh. I was just thinking about the time when, I don't know about you guys, but all of us probably feel sometimes discouraged. Maybe things aren't going well in your life or or whatever, and you're just feeling kind of depressed and, and maybe extra sad. And, and I remember one night driving home from church feeling kind of like, you know, there were some things that had been bothering me and that, and I was thinking in my mind, you know, like what I could do to, to feel better and that. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I need to think about someone that maybe is going through something really bad, maybe worse than my own experience. And that, so there was a member of our church that was going through a rough time, so I called her. And that when I got home, and that, and <laughs> this may sound a little crazy, but I called her to, to encourage her, right? Well, she ended up encouraging me in that. And that's just kind of how edification yeah. works. And that, because I needed a little bit of perspective that maybe things weren't as bad as I thought they were in comparison to maybe other people. And that, and she, and it encouraged her tremendously that I thought about her. She gave her a chance to talk about some of the problems she was going through. We got to talk about, you know, what God could give us to conquer our problems and everything. It ended up being a win win all the way around, but it's really kind of funny how that's how edification works. It isn't, it isn't just like, okay, I could go out and make someone feel good today kind of thing. Edification often is, is both on the giving and the receiving. That's right. And that, so. And, you know, often feeling down about that, about various things is solved just by finding good things to do. Uh, it's not exactly the same point you were making, but it's similar. Uh, and I think it was you mentioned Elijah. He was so down and depressed. I'm the only one left in Israel. Nobody listens to me now. The queen's coming after me. And what does God do? God gives him some things to do. You got some jobs here. Go take care of those jobs. When we're down, thinking about, okay, what can I do? What positive can I do will help. And that's 
a little similar to what you were talking about. All right, three final things, and I'm done. Uh, and this is about this last point, about edifying others on a personal level with things that we struggle with. Be eager to forgive, not eager to judge. Now, if there's a time for judgment, and there's a time when they're being stubborn in their sin to say, you're being stubborn in your sin. There's a time for that. But don't go into these situations eager to judge. Go into them eager to lift, eager to encourage, eager to strengthen, eager to forgive. And the person you're talking with notices that and makes a huge difference. Um, although, you know, part of that is going to be pointing out, you know, here's why this is wrong when you're dealing with a personal struggle. And maybe they're not really thinking about all the things that are wrong with what they're doing. Uh, remember what Paul wrote at the end of 2 Corinthians after two letters full of criticism. He said, I did all of this for your edification, you're building up. So, you know, part of it is pointing out, well, here's why you don't need to be doing that. But it doesn't have to be done in a judging way. It can be done in a, I want you to do better. You can be strong. And here's a couple of things to keep in mind about why this course is not the course you should be on. Uh, and point out what scripture says about how that's wrong. And finally, show love and reaffirm your love for people that you're talking with, trying to build up. Uh, you know, there was a man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 living with his father's wife. He was still going to church. He still felt like he was a Christian there. He's living with his father's wife. Paul wrote some pretty direct stuff about that in the first letter. I believe that he's the case Paul mentions again in the second letter, in chapter 2, who has now repented. And what does he tell the Corinthians to do? To now reaffirm their love for him so that he's not overcome with excessive sorrow about the mistakes that he's made. And so when you're talking with a brother or sister and you're helping them, you're working together and you're helping them get over that, you know, then reaffirm your love for that person, your appreciation for that person. Uh, and all of those things will helpfully help us, help us uh, to, to be better at building one another.